I did not get to satisfy the message I began last week, and uh, I thought this week was scheduled for the annual address, and to my delight, I, I have one more week because this way I can satisfy what I was trying to finish saying last week. But I want to, I want to kind of review, rehearse a few thoughts from last week's message. Before I do, I want to pray. And I am aware there are many that are sick, a number of folks that we know, family and friends, and some from within this house, and, and it's not all COVID. I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID in a minute. It's not all COVID, but I know the source, it's just the devil. Somebody said it's the pure devil. He's, there's nothing pure about him. He's just wicked, and, and uh, he's after you. But I want to pray and speak healing and health over this congregation, and over our community. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your love today, this day. Thank you for your blessing that always seemed to increase and abound in every way. Father, I speak healing and health over this congregation. I speak healing and health over every home and over those who are connected to this house. Lord, revive, restore, heal, and bless. And Lord, we commit, submit, and surrender ourselves unto you because we want to please you. So let there be healing and health. Let there be wisdom in this house. Let there be, Lord, understanding in this house. Let there be a hunger and a thirst, a desire for righteousness and for you in this house. Father, be supreme here. And I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to deliver this message and let the hearts and ears of each individual receive what you have for each one. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. In review of last week's message, we entitled it A New Day. And so this week I want to entitle this one A New Year. It's a new year for sure. It's a good year. Let me read from a portion from last week. God is faithful, and he will provide for and do all he has promised to do. I believe 2022 will be the greatest year we have ever lived out. So I want to ask these questions, or this question. How much difference do you want to make? And, and put, a, put, put something in your mind. Determine a difference. How much difference do you want to make this year? I encourage all to move beyond the natural and be, uh, begin living through the supernatural. Somebody said, well, we're just natural. Well, you might be, but when you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ and you have his spirit dwelling within you, then that spirit is operating and you become living in the supernatural. Amen. God wants you living in the supernatural. He does not want you bound and confined to the things of, of the nature of this world, of this earth. He wants you living and operating in the supernatural so your prayers can be answered so you can see the signs and miracles and wonders of God that are mentioned throughout scripture and they continue as promises for this day this time and this place Amen. today I refuse to be the same as yesterday tomorrow I will choose to be different than any other day of my life it's going to be a good day it's going to be a good year and so I encourage you to continue with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And as you do so, you will make a difference. We will see the difference. It's a new year. Isaiah 48 and 6. He says this. From now on, I will tell you of new things, of hidden things unknown to you. When you study the scriptures, and I'm thinking in particular about so many scriptures that I find reading through Isaiah, God talks about the things that he knew beforehand, 
that he spoke and that he performed. And he talks about, well, just as this, I will tell you of new things, of hidden things unknown to you. But he tells you about them. And there's some things, I believe, that I trust as we speak that God will be ministering now. But there's some things in your life and about your life that God wants to bring out, we could say enhance. And as one man said, God didn't come to enhance your life. God did not come just to, just to bring some goodness to your life. God came to change your life. He came to change the experience of your life. He came to change the destiny of your life. God did not come just to enhance your life. God came to change your life in the most radical ways. And if you can receive this, if you can believe this, today will not be the same as tomorrow. And you will have greater tomorrows every day from now on. Amen. Well, this scripture correlates with Ephesians 2 and verse 10. Listen to this. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That means he cre- we're his workmanship. He created us. He fashioned us. He did a good job. You know, I've been accused sometimes of being a little bit COD. I just want things in place. I want things on time. I want things done properly. And I've been even ridiculed for that a little bit, and it's okay. It's okay. But I'm glad to know one thing, that if I'm COD, it appears to me God must be COD. (laughs) Amen. I'm kind of looking across here and I'm seeing that every one of you has a, two ears on your head and they're both on opposite sides. I'm looking across here and, and, and you, you have hair that you can groom on the top of your head. You have two legs and two feet. And isn't it amazing that how he divided your ten toes and put half on this foot and half on that foot? Amen. And when, when we look at the whole universe and the sun comes up every day and, and things work so wonderfully well, it appears to me God must be COD. <laughs> Amen. He had a plan for you years ago. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that uh, the fingers... Or, or on your hands, how would it be if your fingers were on your feet and your toes on your hand? How would you walk? Because your fingers don't bend backwards. Amen. Your toes do. How would you walk or how would you, wouldn't that be a strange sight walk, watching you run with fingers on the ends of your feet? Amen. See, he knows, he knows what he's doing. And just as he knows what he's doing in the natural, he knows what he's doing in the spiritual, and he has created your spirit to function properly according to his plan for your life, and he's preparing that just as he says here, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now this will not happen apart from Jesus. Your life will never have fulfillment, completeness, or wholeness if you live or walk apart, if you refuse Jesus Christ. But it's found in Jesus Christ, and then it concludes about these good works that, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Wow. Wow. Praise God. God never intended us to live our life the same over and over and over and over and over. And if you feel like you're doing that, you can find the master of the universe and allow him to be the master of your life 
You can find the creator of the universe and allow him to be the creator of your life. And your experiences will change and they will become new possibly every day. Amen. Now I know there are a few here that if, if it's like in many, many groups, there are probably someone here that's saying, I just don't believe that. I don't even comprehend all of that. Well, just, just kind of listen and, well, I better pause. You're not going to receive that answer just from me. But when you accept Jesus as your Savior, you're going to find things changing radically on the inside. They will change radically on the outside. And you will begin thinking different because he makes you to become, as he said, a new creature or a new creation he changes you completely because he does not want you living out your life the same way you were born amen does that make any sense praise god goodness all right and i'm way behind again let me push through god has a plan for your life this year i want you to look at david this is particularly the part i left off last night that i want i mean last week that i wanted to get to Looking at David as a shepherd boy in 1 Samuel 17 and 40. And he's, he's dealing with Goliath down in the valley. He took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Now, we've kind of alluded to some of this. I want to make this statement Everyone has a giant in your life. Everyone, it, an issue, a problem, a giant issue. And sometimes you may feel like you're, you're up to your knees and sinking fast. We do have problems and issues in our life. Well, those come so that they will prove our need, the necessity of our dependence upon God. I want to show you one more thing in 1 Samuel 17. And verses 43 and 44, your giant will talk to you. Your problem will talk to you. Have you ever had your problem talk to you? Yes. It will talk to you. Because this came to my mind, I'll share it. I remember a number of years ago, maybe 25, maybe 25 years ago, and doing business and in construction, and I was, uh, I guess, uh, in a habit maybe, but I would make a note in the winter with the banker to get me through the winter. Then construction picks up, and I would pay it off and live. And, but there came a time, and I believe it was 1996, and I'd had a note that was one year old and due of $5,000, and I had another one of six months, and it was due of 5000 I did not realize I made them do on the same day, which was June 10th of that year. And I got my notice in, in the mail about my notes, and they're both due. I owe $10,000, and I don't hardly have $100 to deal with at that time. I don't know what to do. And God worked a miracle that within 24 hours before the moment they were due, I received $10,000 in one check. Amen. Amen. As a gift. I didn't even earn it as a gift. You know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that, that the blessing of the Lord is upon us, that the blessing of the Lord will cause us to prosper and he will add no toil to it. And I had been quoting that scripture, seeing that, visualizing, realizing, and God brought it to pass. Let me tell you, these, these miracle signs, wonders, and miracles were not limited to the New Testament, to the book of Acts, but they were all through the Bible, and they are still here today. God is concerned about you. He wants you to trust Him that this is the best year ever. Your enemy will talk to you, your giant. And it says here that he said to David in verse 43 and 44. He said to David, the little runt boy that came out to, to fight him. And the army of the Philistines were on this side of the valley. The armies of Israel were on this side of the valley. So he says to David, 
Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? I guess the guy was so blind he couldn't tell the difference between a stone and a stick. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He said, come here and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Now, be aware that your giant is not capital N, capital O, capital T, your giant is not an imaginary creature. It's not a figment of your imagination. There are giants, there are issues, there are problems that are trying to bring you to defeat, trying to, to make your testimony null and void, trying to destroy you from the inside out and from the outside in. He's not an imaginary creature. And here's the point. Either your giant takes you down or you take him down. Amen? Your giant will talk to you. And that's why you must talk to your giant like this. Don't get out of the habit of telling God about your problems. That's so funny. It's almost comical to me. I hear people telling God about our problems. It's like, God, you know we have a president that is so and so and so and so. Doesn't God already know? You know, I always, kind of rattles me a little bit. I mean, now I know God knows. I wonder why you don't know God knows. Instead of telling God about your problems, learn how to tell your problems about God. Amen. Speak to the mountain. Speak to the giant. Decide who wins before the fight. Amen. Can you, can, does this make any sense at all? If you're going into a fight, don't go into the fight believing he wins and you lose. Go into the fight knowing you're going to win. I like the way a, an old friend of mine said it many years ago. He had told us, he was one of those, man, he was tough. He could take an oxygen cylinder, many of you know what that is, stiff arm, grab it by the neck and lift it up. Now that was, you know, I doubt that anyone in here can do that, but... Somebody wanted to fight him, he'd say, if you're going to fight me, you better pack a lunch because it's going to be an all-day job. <laughs> I like this guy. He, uh, he was an old man, too, when he'd say things like this, and, and you'd believe him. And uh, he knew who was going to win. When you face your giant, you better know who's going to win. Amen. You better already have it pre-planned. Talk to the giant more than he talks to you. So the giant talked to David in 1 Samuel 17, 45. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. How, is there anyone in here that has ever faced an adversary with a sword, with a spear, and a javelin? Amen. Like, like I'm a chatier, whatever. He said, You come against me with those. those that's just mere mortal things he said but i come against you in the name of the lord almighty the god of the armies of israel whom you have defied pay attention to what the devil is bringing against you amen pay attention when the devil is bringing things against your family that's why some here need to wake up and be aware of some of the doctrines that are being brought into our communities and to your children through the educational system and through Big Pharma and through the government. Somebody said, Preacher, I hate it when you get to talking like this. Why don't you stay on the Bible? I am. Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it to you abundantly. And I'm talking about life today. Pay attention to what the enemy is trying to do to you and your family. Amen. 
So he continued in verse 46, this day, I love David. He said, this day the Lord will hand you over to me. I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Can you imagine that big giant Goliath looking at that, that little guy that he called a dog and, and uh, he couldn't believe that they sent him out to fight him? Can, can you believe this big giant never heard anyone speak to him in that manner at all? The devil will, the Bible said it this way, resist him and he'll flee from you. The devil, the devil, resist him and he'll flee from you. And you speak to him. Tell him about your God. He said, today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. If there ever was a day that our friends need to know, if there ever was a day that our leaders, that our nation needs to know, if there ever was a day that our family needs to know, today is the day that they need to know that there is a God in heaven who will empower you to do what he has called you to do, and you don't have to run afraid of any giant, of any issue, of any sickness, of any problem. And David was all wound up. You know, it's kind of like if there's anything that wants to make me preach, it's bad preaching. When I hear bad preaching, I want to get up and preach. Or good preaching. When I hear good preaching, I want to get up and preach. And I'm hearing some of that right now, and I just want to preach a little bit more. I want to tell you a little bit more about the rest of the story. He said, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. When you face an issue or a problem in life, know, confess, profess that it is God that will deliver you. Look at David. After he killed Goliath, his life was never the same. After he climbed his mountain, after he defeated the devil, his life was never the same. So what can we learn from this? After he killed Goliath, one, we can learn, that I believe everybody needs a, a new bag and a few stones. Amen. You need to know what the weapons of God are. 1 Samuel 17 and 49, he reached into his bag and took out a stone. He slung it and it struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into the forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Amen. As he was falling, I think he said in his last breath something like this. I didn't see that coming. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> what can we learn? Second, never be afraid of the mountains or the giants that confront you in your life. Never be afraid. Isaiah 14, 24 through 25. Again, surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will stand. You have to move beyond the natural. Guys, you, got, you better move beyond COVID. God has never designed anything that will keep you in your house unless you allow it from fear and anything else. Amen. You don't have, everybody is afraid of COVID. Well, except for you. I know, I know most of you. You're just not afraid. But they tell us, oh, you ought to be afraid. There is nothing in the Bible in, repeatedly. In fact, it's something like 364, 365 times in the Scripture. It literally says, do not fear or do not be afraid. God does not want you being afraid of anything, but he wants you to trust in him. Amen. Amen. Move beyond the natural. The third thing that we can learn is always look for the new day. 
Isaiah 25 and 1. There's many of these scriptures in the Bible. But it says, For in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. Did you know God has a plan for you? He's had it from long ago. Some of you it was long ago. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of us is what I meant to say. <laughs> Believe God's promise. Expect great things. And know that God's plans are greater than yours. Now, here's some instructions that I've been giving out for many, many years periodically. And I want to share this again this morning. Do not believe. I want to give you three things not to believe. And this will benefit you. Do not believe that people don't listen to you. Okay? Many people stay quiet because they don't believe they'll be heard, that people will listen. Do not believe people don't listen to you. Or... You will be careless with your words. Amen. You'll just say just about anything. Believe that people listen to you and you'll say the right things and they'll listen more. Do not believe that you are not noticed in the crowd. If you believe that you're not noticed in the crowd, you will behave with subordinate behavior. You'll behave in ways that may embarrass you later if you believe people don't notice you in the crowd. People notice you. You stand out. You're standout people because you're a creation of God. And do not believe your meditation has no bearing on your future. Do not believe it doesn't matter what you meditate on. That it, it will not affect you in your future or affect you today. It matters. Everything matters. Everything matters. You are body, soul, and spirit. You have a mind, will, and emotion. Everything matters. And what you think about can and will help shape your future. If you believe your meditation has no bearing on your future, you will find your future with failure and destruction. If your meditation is on the wrong things, it will bring harm, limits, and even destruction into your life. For most people, it is not... who they think they are that holds them back is who they think they are not and let me explain briefly we as human beings with limitations I have wings but I can't fly okay amen Believe that you are someone who matters, who makes a difference, and you can make a difference every day. But it will depend on what you think and how you behave, what you say. It will depend on how you live or orchestrate your life. And you do make a difference, some for good, some for bad. You do make a difference. So with too many people, we think we are not something. Rather, no, when we begin to think we are something, that's not what holds us back because here's what we think. We think we are somebody with limits. We think we are someone who can't achieve enough or do enough or get enough. Instead of believing that we are truly children of the living God, the creation of the Most High Being. See, it's what brings our demise is who we think we're not. Oh, I don't think I'm a, uh, literally a, a son of God. 
I don't think I, I have the powers of God within me. I believe God the Father can live within me and Jesus the Son, the Savior of the world, can live within me. I believe the Spirit can live within me, the Spirit, the inherent power of God, but I don't believe there's anything in me that can help me do anything significant. What? What? When you have the Trinity of the Godhead living inside of you and he promised you, he said, he declared in so many different ways that now you're a new creation. You're not as you were before, but you've been born again. Now you're a son or a child of God. Amen. But yet we go around saying, oh, I'm nothing. I'm just nothing. I'm just a nobody. Just a sinner saved by grace. There's a thousand more things I could say, but I trust the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, right here, right now, empowering you by His Word. You see, what God gives to you, you are to give to to others. I want to read a few of these statements. The one who asks you to live for Him is the one who died for you. The one who asks you to believe in him is the one who believes in you. If he did not have the ability to believe in you, to trust that you would do what was right, he would have never allowed his son to die on that cross to be mocked and ridiculed and suffer in torment and pain. Amen. The one who asks you to believe in him is the one who believes in you. You don't have to believe in yourself. Just believe in the one who believes in you. Amen. The one who instructs us to be whole and go to heaven is the one who left heaven and became sin for us. It said in 1 Corinthians 5 and 21 that we were made to be the righteousness of God and he became sin for us. The one whom we seem to forget too often is the one who will never leave us nor forsake us. The one who commands us to pay 10% in tithe is the one who paid our sin debt with his blood. Amen. Wow. So how do we describe him? There's no way I can, but I want to bring a description of what he is like when he returns to gather his own. It's the same as as when he died. In Revelations chapter 19 verses 14, 13 and 9, or 13 and verse 16, it says, I love this, riding back, coming back, leading the army of heaven, riding on his white horse, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood his own blood the blood he shed in order to wash our sins away he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written King of kings and Lord of lords. When he comes back, he's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords with his royal robe dipped in his own blood. Wow. Proving, showing that final time as he gathers his own to be with him forever. Proving he paid the price. Proving his love for you, his confidence in you, and knowing that you are the children of his father, the children of God. Wow. Does anyone in here believe that? Praise God. I know you do. Praise God. Praise God. I want to give you an opportunity. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior and made him your Lord, let me explain. It is impossible to accept Jesus as your Savior unless you make Jesus the Lord of your life. 
You can't say, oh, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Now I'm going to heaven, and it doesn't matter what I do after this. The Bible says we must make Jesus our Lord. That's what repentance is all about. That's what accepting Jesus as Savior is all about, is making Jesus your Lord. Amen. If you would like to accept Jesus as your Savior and make him your Lord, I would like to lead you in a prayer, an effective prayer, that as we go to the throne, the very throne of God, you can experience that change in your life that is like no other change comprehensible. And he'll change you from this day forward. Let me invite you to stand, and I want to lead you in this prayer. There's no God like our God. There's no Savior like our Savior. There's no healer like our healer. There's no lover like our God, the lover of our souls. There's no strength like His strength. There's no grace like His strength, like His grace. Amen. If you'd like to accept Christ as Savior, let me lead you in a prayer. You can follow me as I pray. Pray in your own words. But let's make Jesus our Lord. Heavenly Father, I believe you. You are the God of eternity, the creator of heaven and earth. You are the lover of my soul. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, your only begotten son, whom you sent to this earth through a virgin named Mary. He came as a baby and became a man. And as a man, he gave his life by the shedding of his blood, by the cruel, through the cruel mockery of a judge judgment of a judge and suffering the pain and the stripes that were beaten on his back in order that we may be healed I believe that this Jesus is my Savior I accept Jesus as my Savior and I make Jesus my Lord Jesus you are my Lord Father, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of all of my sin. Take it all away. Wash me by the blood of Jesus. Deliver me from my shame. Take it all away, the shame of my past, the shame through my life. Take it all away. And I receive grace and peace. And Father, heal me from my pain. All the pain, the pain that was imposed on me by my others and the pain that I impose upon myself wash me I surrender to you my God Jesus my Lord my Savior thank you for this day today I am new today I am clean and I am that new creation and I will serve you all the days of my life it's in Jesus name amen amen if you believe that give him praise if you prayed that prayer give him praise and Tell someone else that you prayed. Let me know. We want to help you take the next step in your approach and in your journey as you serve and honor God. He loves you so much and so do we. God bless you.